Let's round out this series on Streamlit by talking about how we get to production. Welcome to this video on Streamlit. My name is Kevin Fiesel, and I am the proprietor of Catalyxy Services LLC, a consulting firm which specializes in work all across the data platform space, especially SQL Server. As we wrap up this series, I would like to touch upon some miscellaneous notes around hosting Streamlit in production. To this point, we have been running Streamlit locally in what is essentially a debug mode. That is perfectly fine for development, and it might even be okay for some production scenarios if you're the only person using your data application. But if you want to share this with other people within your company, or even to the general public, we have a few things to consider. Join me in the classroom as we talk about hosting Streamlit applications. There are a few different ways to host Streamlit applications. The first is to host it directly on your own server, whether that be on premises or in a cloud provider. The second is to host it in a Docker container with the same on-prem or cloud options available to you. The third option is cloud only, and that is to use the Streamlit community cloud. Finally, you can host Streamlit applications in Snowflake. Let's talk about each one of those four in turn. So you want to host your Streamlit application on a server. In that case, I recommend using a proxy service like Nginx or Nginx, Nginx, well, regardless of whatever you call it, unless you call it Nginx, in which case, please stop that right now. Nginx will allow you forward inbound calls to your Streamlit process. This matters for a few reasons. First, Streamlit is not an incredibly robust service in terms of inbound connections. You can have multiple inbound connections, so it's not a single threaded app or anything. But in comparison to Nginx, there's no contest. If you're running on Linux, you can also host your Streamlit application as a background service using tools like Systemd. I know that a lot of Linux sysadmins dislike Systemd. So if you are one of them and you have a better alternative, let me know in the comments because I'm definitely not a Linux sysadmin and I'd be willing to learn. But if you do want to run Streamlit as a background service via Systemd, you'll need to add a config file to the following location. Let's take a look at what that sample configuration file could look like. The first block describes the unit. Our description is Chicago Parking Tickets Streamlit Service, and this runs after the network is up. After that, we have the service block, the type is a simple service, and we'll execute Python 3, telling it to run our Streamlit application. If there is a failure in the app, we wait two seconds and then attempt to restart. This will run in the default run level, which will either be graphical target or multi-user target, depending on whether you've configured systemd to do anything. If that last sentence makes no sense to you, the short version is we need this section to let our service execute and don't think too much about it. Once we have the config file in place, we can reload the available daemons using the systemctl command. Then we can enable the Chicago parking tickets streamlet service. Notice how we are lower casing all of the letters and replacing the spaces with dots. We can then start the service and check to see if it's running. Now this will also start up on reboot. Now let's talk about option number two, hosting streamlet in a Docker container. Let me show you a fairly simple Docker file for hosting streamlet. We're working from Python 3.12 and installing a few libraries such as Git. Then we want to clone the GitHub repository containing our code and install the requirements in the requirements.txt file. From there, we expose port 8501 on the container and set up a quick health check. Finally, we'll run the Streamlit application specifying that we will host on port 8501 for all available IP addresses. Then we can build and run the container using the following command. We'll build a container image and call it CPT underscore streamlet for Chicago parking tickets streamlet. Then we can run the image exposing our port 8501 on the primary machine for the service. The third option we have available is to host an application on streamlet community cloud. This is a free service and works well for demo applications and community tools. You do have some limited capabilities to restrict access to applications, though I don't think you would want to serve up any confidential or critical company information this way. This image comes from an article on the Streamlit blog, and I've added a link to it in the description below. In order to host on Streamlit Community Cloud, you first create the Python script. 
In our case, we created index.py and two more pages in the prior demos. We then can push the repo into GitHub. On the Streamlit Community Cloud website, we can link our GitHub account, choose a repository and a branch that we want to deploy, and then we get a deployed Streamlit application. There is not a lot to this hosting service. So if you are just trying things out, it is free and hey, that might do the trick for you. The final option that I will only briefly mention is hosting your Streamlit application in Snowflake. As a quick reminder, Snowflake bought Streamlit and so Snowflake has integrated some Streamlit capabilities into their cloud warehousing platform. If you are a Snowflake customer, you can host Streamlit applications in Snowflake. Well, that is unless you are using AWS Private Link or Azure Private Link. In that case, you're out of luck for now. There are also a few product limitations when you host in Snowflake versus self-hosting. But if you have a scenario in which you want to keep your Streamlit app as close to the data that you're hosting in Snowflake as possible, you can do that. Now let's talk about a few tips and tricks for hosting, regardless of where you've deployed it. First, Streamlit is not a general purpose web framework. It's not Django, and you're better off not trying to make it a full-fledged web framework. It is really good at displaying visuals and interacting with data, not with account management, transactional processing, or complicated web tasks. Second, try to limit your input ranges to reduce network traffic and improve performance. I grabbed this tip from the Streamlit blog, which notes that every possible value in a dropdown list gets sent to the user's web browser. So if you have a dropdown list with a range from one to one million, every one of those values gets sent as an option, and that alone can be an enormous amount of network bandwidth for a web page somewhere on the order of 100 megabytes of data per user per call. If you use a slider, that doesn't have the same network capacity requirements, but it can increase memory utilization and would lead to additional sets of cached results. Instead, if you can think about your data in discrete blocks, that would help. So for example, instead of one to one million as a continuous variable, maybe you have ranges every 200K. So you have five range options rather than one million point options. Speaking of caching, take advantage of it to reduce the number of times you need to hit the database or to perform expensive computations. If your data is slowly changing, you might be able to cache it for a considerable amount of time and improve the user experience as a result. Another bit of advice around performance tuning is to keep expensive assets like trained models local to your Streamlit application. Don't download them every time you start the app, especially if these things rarely or never change. For example, let's say that our application relies on a particular neural network model in Onyx format, and that model is two gigabytes in size. We store the model in a storage account, whether that be Azure Blob Storage or S3. If we grab that model every time the app starts, we need to wait for the download to complete, and we need to pay for the cost of blob retrieval and network transmission every time. If that model is static, there's really no benefit to doing this. Instead, keep the model someplace on server where you don't need to grab it over and over again. Like any other application, you're going to want to optimize database queries and API calls to reduce latency. That's a fairly straightforward piece of advice, but given how Streamlit opens itself up to exploratory development, it is a good reminder to spend some time cleaning up your code after your product has stabilized. Finally, I mentioned this in the self-hosting section earlier, but you will likely want to use a proxy server like Nginx. That way, you can host multiple copies of your Streamlit application at once for load balancing and be able to pass different users between different instances of the application. That's all I've got to say about Streamlit. Over the past several weeks, I've provided an introduction to the library and showed some interesting problems you can solve with it. Along the way, we've also messed around a bit with Azure OpenAI and saw how Streamlit has some built-in capabilities to work with large language models, as well as Azure AI services and its speech service. Now there might be a Coda video or two on the topic, but as of right now, this is all I've got planned for Streamlit at this time. If you would like to see me cover some other topic, add a comment and I'm liable to put it on my backlog. We'll have links and show notes in the description below. And until we see each other in the next video, take care.